morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, this uh, pre-recording uh, pre of the someone as our live audience. Uh, I'm so excited to see some new faces. Okay, new to me. <laughs> uh, Karibuni sana, welcome. Uh, we're going to pray and then we'll begin. Um, let's bow our heads. Oh Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy. We thank you for the privilege of being able to hear your word um, without uh, oppression. We thank you and we glorify your name. We ask that you speak to us, speak through your messenger this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to do some singing. Please feel free to rise and, you know, clap and sing along. Um, as you may have seen, there are lyrics on your chairs. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Where you go, I'll go. I stay when you move, I move. I will follow you. All our ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my side, high above my life. I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Together where you go, where you go, I'll go, where you stay, I'll stay, when you move, I'll move, I will follow you, where you go, I'll go, where you stay, I'll stay, when you move, I'll move, I will follow you. I love how you serve, I'll serve in this life I lose. I will fall one more time. Who you love, I love who you serve, I'll serve if this life I lose. I will follow you, light unto the world, light unto my life. I will live for you. You're the one I seek, you're the one I find. All I need in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah. Amen. This is the God that we serve, um, that He calls us to abide in Him. Let's turn to the next song. For the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written. can beat me then depart no tongue can beat me then depart when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because the sinless savior died my 
sinful soul is counted free for God to just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me behold him there the reason lamb my perfect spotless Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot hide. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Can you do that last part one more time, one with himself? One with himself, I cannot hide. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Amen. You may have your seats. At uh, this time, I'd like to welcome um, Pastor Jeremy to carry us from there. Karibu. Right. Sante Victor. Good morning, everybody. Good morning again. It's great to see everyone. So we're just going to keep the tape rolling and get into the word it's great to have you in our garden it's great to be with a live audience again i have yet to preach in person at mckinney hall i'm looking forward to doing that next week but just to have you guys here it's just not fun to preach to a screen so we welcome all of those who are watching the recording and if next week you're watching the live stream or the recording later uh, we welcome you as well so we've had to adjust so much but i gotta tell you it is not ideal to preach to a screen, even when it's a live Zoom. Uh, but God's been really gracious, and it's been really a joy to have as many people as possible joining, having a sense of togetherness. Uh, so even this morning, hearing your voices here in the garden has been a real treat. Theology. What is theology? Now, if you know the construction of words at all, it's fairly simple. Theo is God. Logi, the study of. Theology is the study of God. Now, a lot of Christians, a lot of people shy away from theology, doctrine. They think, oh, that's for the theologians. That's for the, the pastors or the scholars. But actually, everyone is a theologian. If you think about God at all. In fact, I would argue that even atheists who deny the very existence of God, when they're thinking about God's non-existence to them, they're actually doing theology. So we are all theologians. So this morning, today, we began this series called Theology 101, Union with Christ. And so in this topical series, and we're going to do this about once a year, where we dive into some fundamental doctrine, fundamental theology of the Christian life, because we're all theologians. And so this idea of union with Christ is a fundamental theological truth that many people don't know about or haven't explored in depth. And so here's the problem. Here's how we get to union with Christ. And here's how I want to frame it for us today. Because I think in our modern world, we live as these detached individuals, these autonomous individuals who have a kind of arm's length relationship with God. We may even think in terms of, oh yeah, I have a relationship with God. You know, I invited Jesus to live in my heart, but I think we so often think of ourselves as fairly detached from him. Like, here I am as this autonomous individual, and God is, is over there. And maybe when I need him, then I go to him. Or it comes about this way. It looks like this. We say, it's my life, and God is part of my life. Or we are satisfied with doing the minimum to get by. I say, all right, I, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I have a relationship with him, but I get content just doing the minimum to get by. 
Well, true believers, and I think most of my audience here this morning and on the screen watching are people who are professing followers of Jesus. But if you happen to be watching and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to submit to you today that this is the heart of Christianity. So when we talk about the good news of Jesus Christ, this union with him is what we're really talking about when we talk about life with God. And so for those of us who are professing followers of Jesus, we may think, all right, I've, I've got my ticket to heaven. You know, I, I am settled. And we just kind of do the minimum to get by. Well, all true believers will bear some fruit, but Jesus desires that we bear much fruit. So union with Christ. What is union with Christ? Well, if you've ever been reading in the New Testament, especially in Paul's letters, perhaps you've come across this phrase, in him, in Christ. And you've wondered, what in the world does that mean? Why does Paul say it this way? Well, in fact, this really uh, comes to its core in Paul, this idea of union with Christ, because he uses this phrase over 160 times in his 13 or so letters. In fact, Paul invented new phrases in Greek, the original language, just to get at this idea. So this is the Christian life, union with Christ, being in him, being in Christ. This is the Christian life. It's life lived in him. And one way to think of this is that it's a relationship with God, the idea of a relationship with God taken to a much higher, deeper, and richer level. And so with that, we're going to take time now to see where this is fleshed out in one particular passage from the words of Jesus himself. So let's hear the word of the Lord from John chapter 15. Elizabeth, welcome. John 15, 1 to 17, NIV. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in the name of my Father will I give you. This is my command, love each other. Well, it's the word of the Lord. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that reading. Well, for those of you who are here live, if you want to pull John 15 up on your phone, you may want to do so. I'm going to be referring to it. Uh, from time to time, and it'll be up on the screen for those watching. There's an approach we're going to take to understanding this text that you can actually use for any text in the Bible. And so I want to commend it to you as a tool for Bible study. And that's the first question, who is God? Then what has God done? 
who are we as human beings and then what should we do so those four simple questions if you go to any text it'll look different depending on the kind of book you're in or the genre but basically you can ask those four questions and really come to understand a text better and walk away with something so what has God done excuse me who is God what has God done who are we and what should we do in response so we're going to look at the passage in this way so first who is God in this passage well first he is the true he is the gardener the father is the gardener and is the one who loves the son so we have the father and son in this passage two persons of the trinity who are featured in this particular passage the father is the gardener father loves the son Jesus is the true vine of course he's the son of the father and he's a friend to the disciples so very simply that is who God is in this passage and we could explore for an hour alone his identity as father and son God as father and son but then let's look at what God has done or what does God do that's another question you could ask as we think about now we're looking particularly at the disciples and the ones who are hearing Jesus say these words also John's original audience but now for us 2,000 years later what has God done or what does God do even now for his disciples in 2021 what we see in verse 3 that he has cleaned the disciples through the word spoken he says you are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you so this is the establishment of union with Christ on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross and the victory through the resurrection we are clean we are washed we are cleansed and so he wants to make that clear to the disciples even after he's told them about him being the vine and the pruning of the branches and all of these things he wants them to know that they are already clean because of the word that he has spoken well what else has God done well Jesus says he remains in us. We see this throughout the text. Remain in me as I remain in you. Well, going back to verse 2, the Father cuts off branches that don't bear fruit. Then for those branches that are bearing fruit, he prunes them. And so for those of us who are his followers who are bearing fruit, whether it's much or little, we know that part of the pruning is painful this is the kind of hardship we can go through where Hebrews talks about the discipline as hardship when we go through just the toil and the struggle of this life there's a pruning that happens the father loves the son that's another thing we see that God does the father loves the son and so Christ has loved us there in verse 9 the son has kept the father's commands as demonstration of his love for the father love has been there among the Father, Son, and Spirit for all eternity. But here what we see articulated is that the Son demonstrates that love by the way he keeps the Father's commands. That's verse 10. Verse 13, we see that Jesus lays down his life for his friends. And then finally, in what God has done or what God does is that he calls his disciples friends. Verse 14, I no longer call you servants, but now I call you friends. That's a staggering reality that should blow us away. That the creator of the universe, who upholds the universe, Hebrews says, by the word of his power, he calls us friends. So then in light of that, who are we? What is our identity? Well, we see there in verse 5 that we are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. This is an intimate expression of our union with Christ. So if you want to think, okay, what, what is union with Christ? I wonder how much you think about intimacy with Christ, with the creator of the universe. This organic metaphor that Jesus uses here to talk about the union with him, the union he has with the Father. He uses this organic metaphor. And then, of course, we see Paul using this organic metaphor of the body, that by extension, we have Father, Son, and Spirit in this intimate relationship. We have God with his disciples being the vine and the branches. And then disciples together, followers of Jesus being this body expressed in local churches like ours. There's a book that I've been using as one of my guides 
to this idea of union with Christ and the way I've been learning and how to teach this and understand it. And one of the simple things that an author called Rankin Wilborn says is that union is the secret to communion. So I think most of us who've been following Jesus for a while, we've had periods in our life when we were, oh, we say, on fire for God. We were experiencing this deep intimacy with him. There was a passion, perhaps, a mountaintop high. We were experiencing a communion with him. Well, whether you've ever, ever experienced that not, or bef- have experienced that before or not, or perhaps you're in a season where your love kind of feels cold. Maybe you feel like you're in a bit of a valley. What Billborn is saying here is that union is the secret to communion. How much do we understand our union with Christ? The fact that because of what he has done, we are united with him. That is the reality that we rely on. Then say, okay, based on that, may my communion with you grow ever deeper. The other thing we see about who we are or who human beings are in this passage is that they are his disciples if they bear fruit. Verse 8, look at that. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So you see this lime tree over here. We'll put a picture up for those watching on the screen. But this little lime tree over here we got as a gift from some friends a couple years ago. Now, neither Tamara nor nor I have green thumbs whatsoever. Our gardener has tried his best, but this thing right now is not doing so well, you can see. We've resurrected it, so to speak, before, where it almost died, and it came back, and it was greener. But as much as we try, we have a hard time getting this to even have green leaves, let alone actual limes. I have no idea if at some point it will grow limes. Now, to know if this is a healthy tree, what do we do? We don't dig up the roots, maybe hire a botanist to come inspect the roots to see, is this a healthy tree? No, we could just look at it to see, is there fruit on this tree? And right now, absolutely not. Maybe someday someone will enjoy limes off of this tree. But it's the same for a follower of Jesus. It's the same for a disciple. Do we bear fruit? And his longing for us, his desire is that we bear much fruit. That's the proof if we are truly his disciple. Then we also see that we are friends. He says to them, you are my friends if you do what I command. Now this is not about them earning his love or earning acceptance because they perform. But no, this this is them showing themselves there in verse 14, showing themselves to be his disciple because of how they obey his commands. Well, then we also see that they are friends, and even we now are friends of Jesus. So he is our friend because he's made known what he's learned from the Father. He's made it known to us. So he says, now I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. So even if we are faithless as a friend, he will remain faithful. He will always be that friend. I said, now based on that identity of who we are, what should we do? That's the fourth question. What should we do in response? And here Jesus is saying, remain in me. Other translations will say, abide, abide in me. Remain in Christ. That is the heart of what we are called to do in response in this passage. So five times that command is given. Remain in me. This word remain or abide is there about 12 times, depending on how you count it. That is the heart of this passage, to remain to abide. You probably know this if you've been in the church for a while, if you've been following Jesus for a while. This is a very familiar passage. But maybe you've never understood it, or maybe you're at a point now in your life where you're like, I know that's true, and that sounds good, but what does that mean practically? Well, look at verse 7. Allow his words to remain in you. If you remain in me, he says, and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What does it look like for you at this point in your life to have his words abiding in you? As I was starting this series that's going to go on for the next month, 
is I was reading different resources and commentaries and just different books and these passages themselves. I was really hoping for some kind of secret solution, some kind of like new, innovative, just insight. Like this is how you practically live this out. This is what union with Christ means. Well, guess what? It was nothing new. <laughs> so I've got nothing new to offer you if you're here in the garden or watching on the screen. But it's like this. Imagine someone who goes to the doctor and they're having chest pains. And they're really worried. They're like, doc, I don't know if this is like heart disease or maybe I had some kind of mild heart attack, but I'm having these chest pains and I'm really worried. So the doctor does all kinds of tests. And she comes back and she says, the tests were inconclusive. There's nothing serious. I just want you to go home and eat better, exercise, and get some rest. Those three things that we all know we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to eat better, exercise, and get some rest. And you're like, Doc, wh why am I paying you all this money? Or why, why, why is my insurance paying you all this money when that's all you're going to tell me? Well, I think a lot of us approach the Christian life like that. We think there's some secret solution or this thing that's really wrong in me. There must be some answer. But he comes back and he says, my words need to remain in you. And so as a pastor, there could be times where encouraging myself, other leaders, and the church body to just remain in the word, to be disciplined, to be in the word, and to be in prayer. There can be this fear that, oh my gosh, this is going to get so old. But church, the reality is I've got, I've got nothing new to offer you on that. This starts with Jesus and throughout our 2,000 years of church history. That's been the secret to abiding in him, to remaining in him, to, to wake up first thing in the day or to go to bed at night and say, you know what? I'm going to open the word, whether it's for five minutes or 50 minutes, and I'm hearing the creator of the universe speak when I read this book. And then I go to him in prayer and I can even say to him, would you increase my appetite? Would you increase my hunger and my thirst for your word? Well, perhaps you're still unsure. Maybe at this point in your Christian life, you're feeling apathetic or dubious. You're doubtful that this is going to work. You say, I've heard this, I've tried it, and I'm telling you, it just doesn't work. I just don't like reading. I just don't like reading the Bible. I struggle to pray. But look, if you view those simple ingredients of the Christian life, of life in him, if you view them right now as a burden instead of a path to freedom, then can I submit to you that you're actually resorting to some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy? If you say, look, when I go read the Bible, it's just going to be boring. Uh, I'm not going to get much out of it. Or when I go to prayer, I just think, you know, it doesn't really work for me right now. Well, then of course that's going to happen. You're engaging in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't have a magic pill for you. There's no quick fixes. And that's really hard. Because we experience the toil and the rat race, the daily grind of life. I mean, if you just look around at the internet, all the different fads around diets and exercise, it's like, you know, someone comes up with six-minute abs. If you want incredible abs, here's a thing. Do it in six minutes. And you think next year someone's going to come up with five-minute abs. We just want some quick fix to be healthy and spiritually for our health. Think of it this way. If your appetite, your physical appetite, is, consists of candy, if your diet is candy, and so your appetite is dulled by candy, someone could lay out this amazing buffet feast for you and even though it's just incredible food made by a two michelin star chef you'll probably you probably actually won't be hungry because you're just so consumed with candy and so it may be the same for you today that perhaps even especially during the pandemic if your appetite is dulled by netflix and facebook and other forms of social media and entertainment like those aren't bad in and of themselves, but has your appetite become dulled, affected by 
what is essentially candy. I'm not denigrating those completely, but you get my point. That it can distract us. It can make us lose our appetite for the daily discipline of being in the Word and being in prayer. So remaining or abiding is an action. And Jesus commands it. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Dallas Willard, who, the late Dallas Willard, who wrote so beautifully about the spiritual disciplines, he says that grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. Many of us can fear that, okay, when I really seek to be disciplined and get in the habit of being in the Word and prayer, that's just going to turn into legalism. How does that square with grace? But I love the way he says that. The grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning that we can't perform our way into this union with him. He's accepted us on the basis of his work on the cross and in the resurrection and our faith in that. So like a dog, many of you in the garden here met our little dog. Like our dog or any dog who's commanded to stay, we have to exert, or that dog has to exert a lot of energy to avoid distraction. If you've ever seen a dog, especially a puppy who's learning this, right? You'd see them working really hard, like, and then squirrel! There's a squirrel up in the tree or on the fence, and they just lose their focus. And so what they have to learn to do is to say, okay, I am fixated on the master. So what distractions are there in our life that can so easily pull us away? And the reality is we actually have to exert energy to stay our Savior, our Master, who's also our friend. He wants us to be able to rest in Him. So what does it look like for you right now to stay in that rest? And it's going to take some discipline to do that. Maybe it's a walk in Karura by yourself. And as Lily talked about doing that dinner, so to speak, with Jesus, or I talked about doing a DTR, a define the relationship walk with God, to say, I need to rest in in you. I need to abide in you. Well, another thing that we are called to do in response is to reject an independent mindset. Look at verse 4. No branch can bear fruit by itself. That's hard for us to hear. That's independent-minded modern people. That's hard to hear. He says, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing, Jesus? He says, nothing. Don't think that's just hyperbole or exaggeration by Jesus. We see all kinds of good works in this world, but he's saying truly for you to bear fruit. You've got to abide in me. We're also called to keep his commands. And here, where he gets really specific, is to especially love each other. So growing in affection, yes. May, may there be a deepening affection for the church family that is, gets expressed in practical ways. But I think here, beyond just growing in affection, I think one of the real ways love shows itself today is by how we inconvenience ourselves for the sake of other people. Nobody really likes to be inconvenienced. Maybe, maybe once, maybe for a brief time. But I think one of the clear ways as followers of Jesus that we can be called to love and to express that is how do we inconvenience ourselves for other people. I think a lot of Christians think of the Christian life like a motorboat where you're the one who provides the power and the direction and you steer that motor and you pull the throttle and you are driving the boat. Or others think of it like a raft where you're just in the raft you're just along for the ride. But a better illustration, I think, a true reality, the true reality of the Christian life is that it's like a sailboat. So numbers of years ago, during uh, university days, we were at this camp as our, in our Christian union. And they had these small little sailboats out on this small little lake. Now the problem was there wasn't much wind, so it wasn't a good idea to begin with. But I had never sailed in my life not in a small boat, let alone a big one. But a friend and I went out on this small boat and we had no idea what we were doing. And I think less in less than five minutes, we completely 
capsized. So your sailboat is hard work. And for experienced sailors, what they know is that they can't control the most important thing that makes that boat go, and that's the wind. And this captures the Christian life because the Holy Spirit is one who provides that wind. But we still have work to do. We have to work that sail with those ropes to get in position where the wind will catch the sail. And at times it can be really hard work. Maybe if the wind is blowing hard or there's not so much wind, we can't figure out why are the conditions the way they are, but we still have work to do. So I wonder if you've wondered, is there more to it than this? You know, as you think about your Christian life and maybe like so many when you were younger, maybe as a teenager or in university days or as a young adult, you just felt like, I'm just... I'm so on fire for God. I'm so passionate for Him. I experience this intimacy. But whatever age you are, whatever stage in life you're in, maybe you're at a point where you're just dry. And you realize there's got to be more to it than this. And maybe there's this big gap between the, the truth about God and who God is and what God has done and your feelings and your circumstances in life. And there's this gap between where you are now and where you want to be. And you perhaps long to change, but you feel stuck. So church, can I encourage you to pray that prayer? One of my favorite prayers in the Bible. I believe, help my unbelief. That it's actually okay for you to come before Jesus to say, I want to want intimacy with you. Or maybe for you, it's I want to want to want intimacy with you, union with you. But to say, you know what? Maybe even this sermon today, this text, this, maybe this whole idea is brand new for you. And my hope is that it could even liberate you to realize this is true of you. This is true of me, that I am united to him by faith. And on the basis of that, I step out and I grab that sail I say, okay, Holy Spirit, blow, blow in me and through me so that I can come alive more and more and bear much fruit. Let's pray. God, you are so good because of the fact that you don't start off with telling us what to do or even telling us who we are, but you start by showing us who you are and what you have already done to accept us, to make us clean. So I pray even now for those who feel dirty, who feel so sinful, that they would come to you and once again ask for forgiveness, knowing that you are ready Father, that you are the God who runs to us with open arms of forgiveness. And you throw a feast for us. So Lord, may the truth, not just the idea, the truth of union with Christ ring so true in our hearts this morning. Lord, that it ignites us to run after you, to grab that sail, And say, God, I want a deeper communion with you because of the union that's already there. Lord, for anyone watching who doesn't know you, who maybe because of this sermon has said, maybe I actually don't know him. Because I don't think I have a union with him. Lord, would you stir their heart to have faith and repent and follow you. So Lord, based on this union with you, and a deeper communion. Lord, may we go and bear much fruit to impact our neighbors, our households, and this city that you've called us to. Lord, may we bear much fruit to your glory, showing that we are your disciples. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.